There's again the Gospel of John, chapter 17. And I want to read with you these words again. You heard them earlier, but I want you to hear them again. This, is, this entire chapter uh, really is the, the basis of my series over the next five weeks. The whole idea that Jesus uh, was going on a business trip. If you, can, if you really think about it, Jesus had a task when Jesus came from heaven to earth. It was as if he came for a specific reason. We kind of pick up on that, don't we? We, we think about Jesus' life being about a lot of things, honestly. Uh, I know I do. Uh, we learn from the life of Christ, don't we? How to live. We, we learn how to... I, I, I think we learn more about how to treat people with respect and how to love people well through the life of Christ. But if you really think about the, the purpose of Christ, what was it? When Christ came, he had, he had this business he had to take care of. And so in a sense, we have this business trip, and that's the theme I have for this month. So God, is, God the Father has sent his Son. God the Father has sent Jesus the Son. God the Son. Two words for us. So let's hear these words again as he says in John chapter 17. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and he prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. You granted him authority over all the people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus has a way of saying things simply. But at the same time, when Jesus says things simply, and we begin to read, if you're like me, reading passages over and over again, you begin to pick up the nuances of really what he meant by using some of the most simple words, and yet some of the most profound words. And we find this here in our passage again. The words of Jesus. The words of God the Father. The words of Jesus the Son. Look at the Old Testament when we begin to look at who Jesus really was, what it meant to know God. So, so the idea of knowing who God is was the important thing that Jesus would bring to us. So how do we know God? As it says in verse 3. We look at right at the beginning of Adam and Eve, who God, it says God knew them in the garden and gave them the things that would cause them to have fellowship with him. It was a pure knowing as this was their life before their fall into sin. They knew God in a way that you and I never have. Next it was said that Noah walked with God. What an amazing, now whether that was a metaphor or literal, and I believe it is a metaphor, Noah obeyed God. And I have to believe that with Noah, it was a, a very close relationship because it was said that there was no one else righteous on the earth. Do you ever walk in dark places and feel like, am I the only one that believes in Jesus right now? You have, haven't you? But think of what it was like for a person to walk the face of the earth, not just your workplace or your place where you're at, like the mall. On Black Friday, did you think that there was a Christian anywhere? Right? <laughs> and that there were, of course. There were, of course. So Noah walked with God. Abraham knew God enough that God sent his blessing through Abraham. God said of Abraham in Genesis 12, he says this, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. That was Abraham knowing God. Moses asked God who he was and what did God tell him? He says, I am the I am. I am the I am he told him. Just knowing the presence of God was enough according to God. Even in the fear that Moses had for God, 
in the burning bush experience. There he was, experiencing a trembling, you know, and, and of course, uh, even Moses was instructed to take off his shoes because he was standing on holy ground. And we sense that, that awesomeness, that reverential fear of God. God said to, to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. And we begin to hear that, that phrase throughout Scripture, other places, I will never leave you or forsake you. Joshua 1.5. God knew that King David, through David's anointment, through Samuel, when it says, so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers, and from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. In power. Isaiah had an experience like none other in Isaiah 6. You might know this passage. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, says Isaiah, seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another in this fellowship, will you? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. We see through the Old Testament these examples of knowing and experiencing God. We want to know God. And knowing how to know God is exactly why Jesus came. God wanted to make Himself known to us Oh, he, was, he made himself known to the patriarchs. But God had a second part to his plan. He cared so much about the patriarchs, which we just listed. But God says, I'm going to do something so different. I'm going to send me, my son. I'm going to send me to the world so that they can see me firsthand. Because I want to be patient with everyone so that no one has to perish. You see, God's patient with us. And so he sends his son. So Jesus comes to us on a business trip. I tried to dress up a little more like a businessman today. Maybe I should have worn a white shirt. That would really be business. Nice thought, Pastor. Next time. So let's look at what kind of Jesus God the Father sent. With what power did God send his son? And there are three things that I see particularly in these five verses of John 17 that will really help us. Let's look at them together. The first way in which we, uh, Jesus reveals the Father is simply this. Jesus and God love to play games. Now, I'm not trying to mess with your head a little bit here. Okay, maybe I am. But the, the first point is that God and Jesus, God the Father and Jesus, they love to play games. Think about this. In the second part of verse 1, it says, Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. It's not that eternal life or the death of a son or even the torturous life Jesus would have to endure was silly. Uh, that was certainly the game of life, and that was a serious game, wasn't it? We don't take that lightly, but what I see in this, in this verse is, is a supreme love for relationship. The Father and Son take turns glorifying each other. Jesus says, glorify me that I may glorify you. The Father glorifies the Son by sending him the gift of salvation to the world. And the Son glorifies the Father by being obedient to the Father. I love that. There's a fellowship between God the Father and God the Son. And that should provoke us from within. It should do something to us to say that relationships spiritually are everything for us. It's about a relationship of love. A few Thanksgivings ago, we were playing a game. Amelia and I were on the same team, my youngest daughter. She was much younger than now, probably about uh, 10 years old. And we were playing Pictionary. And I felt like, because Katie and Judy, Katie being five years older than her sister, that we are at a bit of disadvantage. So I was kind of prepared just to play this game and have fun, but I was prepared to lose. 
And so we sat down to play this game, and of course I didn't say any of that, but being a good dad, I was preparing myself to have fun because I love to win, okay? And, and so there we were. What I forgot and what I was reminded in just a few moments was that Amy has an incredible love for art. And we began to blow them off the table. <laughs> we had so much fun. I was with this younger daughter, seemingly at a disadvantage, but Amelia could draw pictures. And I'd say, I know what that is. She said, I know what that is. I know what that is. And we had so much fun. And, and we won that day. And I wouldn't have told you that story if Judy was here in the sanctuary. But <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We love to play games. I'm just trying to illustrate how, how much fun and, and, and I know all the seriousness of why Jesus came to earth, but how much joy Jesus the Son had with his Father. We need to recognize that. We need to understand all throughout Scripture just how joyful the Godhead is. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit just being with each other. And they teach us. They teach us how to honor each other. They teach us how to respect each other. They teach us how to cohabitate at moments when you, you don't agree. You know, what did Jesus say at times in his life? Father, let this cup pass from me. That was a serious moment. Were they in conflict? Not at all. It was loving each other through the most difficult moments of life. It's about caring for each other so deeply that you fulfill your commitment to that person. And how about God doing the same for us? God continually seeks an exchange of love with you, and he wants your love to come back to him. It's not silly. It's deep. And it's abiding if you will let it enter at the deepest parts of your heart. You see, Jesus comes to reveal to us the heart of a father. You see that? That's his business. So the second way in which Jesus reveals the father this morning is embracing the authority the father has given him. Now in verse 2, we see that it says, for you granted him, he's referring to himself, Jesus is speaking in a different way. For you granted him authority over all people. So Jesus the Son knows in his conversation with his Father right now that he has been given this authority and he embraces it. And so Jesus glorifies the Father with the miraculous power that can only come from God the Father when Jesus gives testimony to his miraculous birth. He speaks of that. Uh, the, the miracles themselves, Jesus is consistently through the Gospels telling people, this is the power that comes from my Father. I'm delivering this power that only comes at this point from the Father. The wisdom that is matchless that Jesus speaks with when we're spellbound by just a phrase that Jesus would say, and we study it, and we, we, we ruminate in it, because we want it to take root in our own heart. The presence of the Father being so important to Jesus that he would, he would withdraw from the masses. He would leave the disciples behind and go up on the mountain to pray, yes, but more than that, to be with his Father. Jesus embraced the authority that the Father came. Jesus glorifies, or the Father glorifies Jesus when the dove comes upon his son at baptism. Do you remember that? When, when, when God provides, when God the Father provides the, the, the transfiguration moment, when the patriarchs show up on the mountain, and the disciples are there too to experience this moment that if you think this is just about this moment of God sending His Son, you need to know that there's a fellowship that's broader than that. The patriarchs are in heaven today. Even as we worship here this morning, they're with God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, I know there's a lot of debate about where believers are in, in, in the in-between and all of that, but 
But we know that beyond this life, when we breathe our last breath, we are in the presence of the Lord. We're in His care. Wow. How about God's willingness to turn His back on His Son? We don't see relationship there, do we? But we do. We do see relationship. You see, God was willing to turn His back on His Son while His Son paid the debt of sin held against man. There was a willingness to be separate for a moment so that an important task could be completed. God's power was displayed when upon the death of His Son, the curtain of the temple was, was rent from top to bottom, torn literally from top to bottom. Remember that the curtain wasn't like this kind of curtain, as beautiful as it is. It, it was thick. It was a thick curtain that no man could tear. And it was torn from the top so that no one could go from the bottom. It, 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 as if you could. But God rent that curtain from the top to the bottom so that we might enter the Holy of Holies because Jesus had done the work of sin upon the cross. Wow! But oh how the Son wanted to come home. The son wanted to go back. The son wanted to be with his father. Do you recognize that in the Gospels too? Did Jesus want to go back to his father out of desperation? I think not. Out of fear? Not a chance. Avoiding the task of, rede of redeeming man? No. Not at all. The son was meant to be home on the throne next to his father because that was his place. And he knew that ultimately he would be back in that a place of authority. But for now, the authority of God was necessary here to re-invite man into the fellowship of God. Isn't that a beautiful, beautiful story? It's a story of fellowship. Jesus was willing to go on a trip that would, with authority, deliver the greatest gift to mankind, knowing God, that we could know Him. And Jesus embraces his authority to deliver that kind of gift. Let me, let me apply this to your life for a moment. Have you embraced the authority that God has given you, believer? Have you? Have you embraced the authority that God gives you when he enters your heart? As a believer, when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have received your marching orders that you would share with everyone the good news of Jesus Christ. Have you embraced your authority to do what Jesus taught you to do? Your unique position in life brings with it influence over people, situations totally unique to you. Whether you have money or not, a certain job or position or not, or whether you have the the, the ear of a particular cause or not. These are the things that God has placed in your care. And you are in your place of influence for such a time as this. You have this position in life. It can even be a negative one in this moment. It, it could be something that's in repair. It could be after something that you've done. But you are in a place because the Bible is filled with with not people who have done great things for God. Do you get that? The Bible is not filled with things that people have done for God. Would you repeat this after me? They didn't do it. They didn't do it. They didn't do it. They didn't do it. What they did was they repented and got right with God. You see, the Bible is filled with people who got right with God. King David had to get right with God. He committed sins that I trust none of you have committed here today. But he committed the most grotesque sins known to man. But he was a man after God's own heart, he's described. Even Moses, who delivered the people of Israel, murdered a man in his day. Things happen in our lives. It's about recovery, friends. And Jesus comes to help us recover. So if you're a recovering sinner, then welcome to 
the sort of AA of the church. We're all recovering from sin. And we have this message of redemption because we repent every day. Oh, whether you have known sin in your life or not, I, when I pray and I repent of, of just, Lord, I fall so short of your glory. It's got to be about you doing a work through me. If you don't do it, it will never get done. God wants to be with a redeeming people, a people who want a redeeming spirit. There was a woman, a uh, speaker I heard years ago, some of you have probably heard of her, Carol Kent. I've told her story before. She's a prolific speaker, well, well received in the Christian world. But when her son committed murder and was sent to prison for life without parole, was it time to stop listening to Carol Kent? Not for me, because when I heard her story at a 1,200-person breakfast, when I heard, heard the time she came to this area, I was in awe of her story. She began to describe her visits to her son, who would never see freedom again. But she also tells the story of a repentant son, who although he will never be free this side of the kingdom, he found a way back to the cross, didn't he? And isn't that us? And I have respect for a man like that, but I especially have re respect for a mom and a dad, the kids who, who knew how to recover. And let me tell you, every one of us have parts of our story where we're thinking, oh man, I wish that wasn't part of my family tree. I remember years ago, we were at a family reunion, and and all of a sudden, we were doing the family tree thing, and I'm not into that, but some were describing that, and all of a sudden, they're going, well, we don't talk about Uncle so-and-so, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and this is like over in Europe, he did something really bad, you know? I was like, oops. I mean, we all have oops in our family, and it, with our friends, and with us. But are we a redeeming people? I pray we are. The third way in which Jesus reveals the Father is this. Jesus becomes the giver of the gift. Just stick with that for a moment. We'll close. The third way Jesus reveal, reveals the Father is Jesus becomes the giver of the gift. In the second part of verse 2, it says, Jesus, he, Jesus, might give eternal life to all those you have given him. The gift is eternal life, isn't it? And Jesus delivered that gift. It's the gift of an eternal relationship. You see, there's two players in this game. We got the Father and the Son playing this so-called game. But then there's another couple of players that enter into the game, and that's you and me. We get invited into this game of life where God glorifies His Son so that He can deliver eternal life to you and me. But to do this, the Son, in turn, has to glorify the Father. And I've spoken of that. Jesus continually speaks of revealing the Father. He says at one point in his ministry, I must be about my Father's business. It is a business trip. It truly is. But Jesus comes to deliver the gift of salvation and eternal life. The little boy... When he went to school, he was the outcast of his class. His mom was always concerned about him. When he went to, to class, he would come home with stories how none of the children would play with him on the playground. She couldn't figure out why. He was shy and he was withdrawn, but he wasn't a bad boy. And yet he would come home and he was discouraged. One time when it was near Valentine's Day, he says, Mom, I, I want enough Valentine's for my whole class. And so she went and got him Valentine's and he prepared Every Valentine card. And he, he got ready to take them to school. And his mom was, she was just really worried. She knew that he had a card for every one of the kids in his class. Many of them who treated him harshly. She was ready with fresh baked cookies when her son came home. Because she knew that more than likely he would not receive one Valentine card in his class. 
And when he came through the door after school, and she was all ready to, to take care of her son once again, he walked in and his face was beaming. He was from ear to ear just happy. And she was like, what, what happened, son? And he says, Mom, not one. Not one. I didn't miss one. He had no expectation of receiving anything, but only in giving. We have Jesus who came, and he had one task in life. He says, I'm ready to give, 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 and give. Wow. Can we figure out how in this Thanksgiving season to be givers of life like that? Jesus never lost the sight of the gift he was to deliver. To know God. That all men might know God. Verse 3 brings it all together for us. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you. Don't miss this, friends. That they may know you, Father, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Is there any mistaking that Jesus knows his purpose? He knows his task is to reveal the Father and to deliver salvation to man. What a Christmas message to begin with. That man may know the Father. May we know the Father through the Son this morning. As much as the Father enjoyed the pure fellowship of His Son, He was willing that none would perish. And so He gave up that fellowship for a time to redeem you and me. There are times when God asks us to give up our fellowship at times to sacrifice for others. Are we willing? My God shows us how. Jesus completed his business trip. Will you complete yours? That's right. Heavenly Father, how amazing it is that you gave us your son. In this season, when we celebrate the baby boy, here it is still November, Thanksgiving Sunday, but Lord, this is the day in which we prepare for the greatest season of the year. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be givers of life to others. Help us to love and even reveal you as you have revealed yourself to us. I wonder this morning, is there anyone here that would say, I don't think I understand or, or really get the gift of Jesus this morning. So I simply close out our time together to ask you, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? The gift has been sent. The Father has sent salvation through his Son. Have you received the gift of salvation? You need to repent. We spoke of this. You just need to give up and say, God, I'm willing to, to do it your way now. I want your son Jesus as my Savior. I accept him. I will allow him to forgive me of my sins. I confess my sins. And I want eternal life. I want to be in that fellowship someday when I meet my Lord. If you need to do that today, pray that prayer. I just prayed it for you. You pray it your way. Confess, accept, repent, and receive. Well, I pray for those this morning that might be accepting Christ. Help them to grow. Help them to be blessed in their new salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand